program is presented by Keep the Faith, a nonprofit Catholic lay apostolate devoted to spreading the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Oh, tell the world about Mary. Go tell the world about her joy. God the Creator was her little boy, and she lull him to sleep with a song for him deep in her heart. Go tell the world about Mary. Go tell the world about her pain. God the Redeemer was her young son slain, and his love she would keep and would ponder it deep in her heart. Good morning, and welcome to a further installment in our, in our coverage of the early days of the Legion of Mary for the viewers of the world. It's being retold for us by Brother Frank Duff in an informal way so that we can capture the flavor and the uh, atmosphere of those early times. Uh, in conversation last night, I was told something about Mr. Duff that uh, he may not uh, want to admit. But I was told that in the early times of his uh, solo work, before the Legion even began, he was called the local madman of Dublin. And I'm just wondering if you're aware of that reputation and how it came about. Well, uh, I wouldn't say that had any particular currency, <laughs> because uh, uh, my um, behavior, behavior was not of uh, an eccentric character, <laughs> and um, I don't know how I could uh, have that quality <laughs> imputed to me. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it weakens a, uh, a thought in me, which was that when I started my picketing uh, at six and a half White Friar Street, uh, I uh, carried my rosary beads, and uh, during the interval, intervals between customers, <laughs> I uh, used to endeavor to say a few prayers. And uh, on, uh, I was this thus engaged one time when uh, a very lofty personage brought uh, a group of girls uh, out from the church and pointed down to me and said, that is our local madman. <laughs> 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 so one of the girls, uh, Emma Colgan, who was uh, not at that time in the Legion, but subsequently came into it, uh, I was a tremendous member, said to him, ah, she said, there's method in his madness. You'll find that he'll shut down the place. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Which happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's marvelous. Yeah. Well, there you are. Well, we certainly know that that's the... Um, there's no eccentricity in, in your history. If, if, if well, of uh, <coughs> course, uh, that was uh, at the time, that particular episode that we have been recounting took place at the time when I was picketing and when Gabbard had departed for England. Oh, yes. You know, that's a point. We wanted to finish that story yes. today from the past interview. What actually happened to Joe Gabbard and... Uh... Oh, yes. Well, if we are attempting any sort of continuation <coughs> of uh, the previous talk, uh, I think that terminated on the note that Gabbard and I were visiting the Grim Enclosure up in uh, yes. Portobello Barracks. That's right. And 
Já bych řekl, že je to třeba jméno u velmi apostolicky. A he wasn't content with the work behind the iron bars of the said enclosure, but his vision looked out over the whole big barrack, which held at that time 2,000 men of the Lancashire Fusiliers. And he bade me to follow him. And I did me. <laughs> uh, that characterized my attitude towards the campers. <laughs> and uh, so we went off out and without leave or license or uh, anything else, we entered one of the barrack rooms. Uh, the men had had their dinner at this particular hour. And they had a wait of some duration, and then they were let out into the city, oh, yeah. free for the rest of that day. And uh, so the men would be um, sitting around, mostly at the ends of the barrack room where the fires were. And uh, he came in, and he had a very, a very uh, powerful, deep voice. <coughs> And he'd say, with the horses, please come up around me. <laughs> and after a bit of hesitation, because they were very perplexed at this uh, strange pair wandering in, <laughs> uh, men would come up, a group of men would come up from each end and array themselves around, and Gabbard would give them a, a lovely little talk about the fact, uh, which presumably they already realised, that they were in peril. And uh, he then uh, urged them to put them, their house into order and be very assiduous in regard to devotion to Our Lady. And uh, uh, he produced uh, the scapular metal, the brown scapular metal, which just before this time, and as a war measure, uh, the Pope had uh, authorised. And these medals uh, were offered and easy to the uh, soldiers and eagerly accepted. Uh, with that uh, particular work became very important and always followed our work inside the Grim Enclosure. <laughs> we went out after the latter and we went for the barracks in general. And uh, in this, we were greatly assisted uh, by the regimental sergeant major, a man called Baxter, who was a convert. And uh, he realized that our mission required a little supporting. That would be the nature of men to say, who are these uh, fellows coming? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he used to make a point whenever he saw us on the barrack square to come down and chat with us. And this was uh, a hallmark. That meant that when the sergeant major approved of us, <laughs> we were OK. Right. And. Uh, uh, we used to make appointments with the men who wanted to go to confession. We would be waiting outside the barrack, uh, the barrack um, at uh, 7 o'clock that evening. And on one historic occasion, 70 men turned up. Is that right? We hastily telephoned out to Milltown Park, one of the Jesuit houses here, uh, to have all men standing by in readiness. And we marched out <laughs> along with the soldiers. They had military formation. And we had the priests of the place busy the whole evening. <laughs> that was an astounding event. Yeah. Yeah. Though uh, all this then was uh, terminated by Gabbard's 
departure for England, for Aldershot. And uh, uh, he vanished from uh, that year, which was 1916, until 1918, when the war came to an end. And he came back then, but a different man. Oh. A different man. Uh, the fire was uh, extinguished, largely. Uh, and uh, he had uh, got the habit of tippling a bit. Oh, oh I see. Oh, Sometimes too, uh, too much. And a new chapter then ensued, which has proved its own great importance in the Legion. And leads me a little further along the road than I had contemplated. Because I was talking to uh, two noble figures, Mr. Lawler, the head of the Vincent de Paul Society, and Frank Sweeney, uh, also of that society. And I was telling them about this tragedy. And they said, bring him down to Mount Mallory. Mount Mallory is the celebrated Cistercian Abbey, uh, the scene of uh, some visits by Sister Flanagan. Oh, I see. <laughs> it was the place where she uh, realized the ambition of her ambition of being ennobled. <laughs> 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 and, um, well, now, Mount Mallory has entered in, in quite a big way, to the history of the Legion. But its beginning was that visit. I had, I mean, it was extensively read in the lore of the Cistercians. I had a great devotion to St. Bernard, and I knew the history of the order very well. And uh, it had a frightening effect on me, because they were so very stiff, so very uh, penitential at the time. But in any case, I brought Gabbard down to Mallory. And that visit, which became an annual visit, I've never missed it in a year, a single year, since that yes, year, yes, that which was 1919. Isn't that remarkable? 1919. And it was there I discovered that book, uh, to Concilio, which uh, was the key that opened up to Montfort to me. Yes, yes. It was there in that, in, in, in that monastery. And... Uh, uh, Gabbard became as enthusiastic about it as I was, and along with me, paid another visit, and then uh, by himself, frequently. And uh, I brought him into the St. Vincent Paul Society at that time. I think he had repudiated, and, uh, but no further. Um, he never came into the Legion, for instance. No. Uh, I it would have had no trouble, of course, in bringing him into that, uh, probably in the capacity of a tribune. Sure. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, so uh, perhaps uh, departs Gabbard from our um, organizational life. But now about, uh, you were asking about uh, Sancta Maria and Bentley Place. Yes. In the early, the, well, that period within the legions. Well, you'd history. have to, uh, you'd have to give me an indication in regard uh, to that because the whole uh, lead up to Sancta Maria is, is an extensive tale in itself. Yes. Does it coincide? That's fine. Yes. It coincides with the development of the Legion anyway, I would suppose. Yes. 
Well, uh, if we go on, say, Sanctum Maria was 1922. And uh, in other words, it was about eight or nine months after the beginning meeting of the Legion. Yeah. The Legion began in September and Sancta Maria began in July. In other words, you had the extraordinary swing from uh, work that is the simplest of all work, perhaps, that is the visitation of hospitals. You had this terrific swing from that to the most difficult of all work. Yes. Uh, and the facing up to a, a very uh, grim sort of business. But, uh, and all that it rather exploded on us. It was another of these uh, things that I would regard as a great honor that uh, the thinking has done uh, not by ourselves, but by the Queen of Heaven. Uh, she knows what's good for us. <laughs> and, but sometimes very hurtful. <laughs> oh. And she leads us along. And that's what took place in the case of Sancta Maria. Because prior to that time, I had become very interested in this question of the street girl. And... Uh, I uh, felt it something should be done about her. See, there was no, the, no provision at that time at all for that problem. Uh, in, in as much as there were four what they call Good Shepherd homes in Dublin, uh, run by religious orders, but they uh, remained there in their sight and they received every girl who would uh, offer herself, but they had no mechanism for going out to search. Yeah. And that uh, was very serious. And also the wildest rumors existed about that type of girl. They were regarded as models of appalling depravity and tough beyond uh, power to deal with them. Uh, so uh, my mind centred on the idea of opening up a very low-class lodging house, which would tempt them in by cheap rates, <laughs> and put up with the fact that they were leading this life, and put a couple of saints <laughs> in charge of <laughs> Uh, who put up with everything <laughs> and used such opportunities as came their way of uh, m moving the girls. That's a very interesting that idea. Was the, that was the plan. So again, this extraordinary process of being led along. Because at that time I got a, a letter from the Reverend Mother of the Baldoyle Convent and uh, Sisters of Charity of Baldoyle. And she said that uh, she had two ladies staying out in the, in the guest house attached to their place. And that these ladies were of the highest quality and wanted to do social work. Would I mind seeing them and helping them? I wrote back making an appointment for one o'clock on a Saturday, which was the hour I got all, I was released on my half day from my place of work. And I met the two of them. I had seen them before. And I realized that they were people of great holiness. Uh, one of them was, uh, Miss Plunker. Miss Plunker was over six feet high. Oh. And uh, her father had been the leader of the Irish Bar. Right. Uh, and um, uh, she was uh, what you'd have to uh, regard as a veritable saint. The other was Miss Scratton. And Miss Scratton had a history. Her father was Thomas Scratton, 
a clergyman of the Church of England who fell under the influence of Cardinal Newman uh -huh. and came into the church. And uh, he accompanied Newman over here to Dublin to found the uh, Catholic University here. Uh -huh. And by, of course, seems to be uh, a coincidence beyond parallel. It would appear to have stayed in 76 Hawkwood Street when they came to Dublin. Isn't that right? Which was subsequently our host. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And uh, the signs of their occupancy were there still evident. Um, so uh, he, he was, he was, uh, uh, a married man, of course, that's a clergyman, and she was mm, one of his daughters. And of course, she was living on in Ireland. So these were the two who um, came um, to me, and uh, I, um, I gave them the works. Uh, in the way of, uh, they had an amazing scheme of their own in mind, which I proceeded to demolish <laughs> <laughs> with the bat flags. <laughs> it was that they would open a restaurant in Dublin. A restaurant? Yeah. And uh, work it with voluntary labour, including themselves, and that the profits of this were all to go towards the Columban sisters who were just at that time being started. Now, all that represents certainly a heroic, but rather, as I saw, a not so profitable use of their services. And I put before them as a counterpoise my download out lodging house. <laughs> Well, if you had suggested to them that uh, um, I should, uh, if it would be a help to souls to jump down Vesuvius, they'd have done it. Yes. I never saw it. Was, there was this utter devotion. <clears throat> and they agreed that if such an institution were presented to them, that they count on them. But in the meantime, they were to join the Legion. Good. And uh, <coughs> in order to bring them in, we started Presidium Number Two. Is that so? Yeah. Number Two. Presidium Number Two. Now that brings just uh, before before we go on to the Number Two, I was wondering if there's anything between 1919 and the, the retreat at the monastery and this period that we're describing now, the idea of the. Uh, the beginning of the Legion and so forth. Is there anything well, of that would tie during, that together? <clears throat> during all that time, <clears throat> pre preparatory to the coming of the actual Legion, that that preliminary association was in full operation. You must well, remember that. Person, yeah. That is that began in 1917, and uh, <clears throat> we were working away in the pattern of the Legion with the monthly meeting. And it was that uh, meeting that quite suddenly transformed itself into the real article as the result of a, our uh, session on the true devotion. But there was no uh, hiatus between um, any of these uh, day dates because it was <laughs> a state of hectic evolution. Uh, the whole time. Hectic. Uh, now, uh, you come along to, um, to the, uh, we set up the second presidium. And uh, that second presidium met in the room behind the one in which number one was meeting. And I was just going to attend that too every week. But uh, among uh, 
Father Creedon had but recently come to Francis Street from the country. And uh, he was, uh, his quality became immediately manifest. And uh, he and I became, uh, just I uh, got for the Creed and for the tour, and I became a sort of um, uh, trinity. <laughs> and we um, talked our plans a great, over our plans a great deal. And I spent a certain amount of my time late at night as we when the ordinary activities would be over in the presbytery with those two uh, great priests. <clears throat> now, I told Father Creedon about my notions about this low-down lodging house, and I told him about this uh, Mrs. Slicker's lodging house uh, in Chancery uh, Lane, where there were 30 girls and uh, where I had entered one evening on the door-to-door -door principle. I was working on my own. Going and door -to -door I went... Huh? By your, you're going door-to-door -door on your pro one of your projects? Uh, this was not be, be work. No. It was development from it. Yeah. But I came in this particular evening into this place, and I found myself in the midst of these 30 girls who were more or less getting themselves ready to go out onto the streets. Oh, well, I was utterly unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thought that came to my mind was, my goodness, if the Vincent de Paul Society is about my being in here, I'd, they'll, I'd be fired out. <laughs> because there'd be no use my saying, oh, Oh, I was going in my private capacity. <laughs> the Phoebe to be at that time was terrified of the man, uh, men getting into any trouble with women. Oh, <laughs> it's, and here was I uh, <laughs> uh, going into one of these places. Well, I was so up, so astonished, so disorientated. <laughs> <laughs> That without a word, <laughs> we could hardly imagine. <laughs> I backed out of the place. <laughs> I had only that one thought in my mind. And, uh, and though I uh, told all these things to Father Creedon, and uh, in the uh, month of June of that year, uh, the uh, very celebrated figure of Father Ignatius Gibney, the Passionist, was giving a retreat to the women of the Francis Street Parish. And uh, he, uh, Father Creedon, brought him one day down to Mrs. Slicker's lodging house just as in the evening time, that before the evening devotions, and just at probably the very same time that I had stumbled into the place. And the two of them gathered the uh, girls together in the big common room and uh, spoke to them gently along spiritual lines. And the result of this was uh, extraordinary You'll understand I wasn't there. Uh, the result of this was extraordinary. The girls all began to weep and uh, to protest that they hated their life. But what could they do? Nobody would touch them. Nobody would employ them. A simple matter for them, they had to live. And uh, at this stage, Father Creedon made uh, a dramatic offer. He said to the proprietors of the place <coughs> that uh, he would pay her uh, an agreed sum for her maintenance of the girls until further notice. And uh, they were, on the other hand, to uh, uh, promise 
that they would not go out on the streets during that period. Although that agreement was come to, and Fourth of Creedon came straight up from that particular business to me and uh, told me what had happened. And uh, I, uh, at once, summoned a meeting for that night. And um, to that meeting, we brought forth the, for the Cretan, of course, for the tour, for the Robinson, another very distinguished figure. And uh, I brought up from the Presidium number two, I brought up these two ladies. And we uh, spent uh, in, in uh, a third time looking at that incredible situation. What on earth are we going to do? Oh, yes, I should have mentioned a very important name, Father Duban. He was a Jesuit, and he had uh, opened the Rathfarnham Retreat House for Men. Now, Father uh, Devan uh, believed in the enclosed retreat. He believed it would break your broken limbs, nearly. <laughs> I never saw such a conviction as he had about the value of a weekend retreat. <laughs> At that particular time, I partially shared his oh. enthusiasm, mm -hmm. which has diminished <laughs> later. <laughs> but um, in any case, he was one of those brought. And uh, we t thought over a lot of things, but the only one that seemed to have uh, promise in it was for the demand suggestion that we gather them together and give them a retreat, three-day retreat. And he volunteered to give the retreat himself, as he said he'd give them hellfire, and that this might uh, incite a number of them to go into the Magdalene asylums, which existed. If that does far, and that's far only, did our thoughts reach out at that particular meeting. But we came to the decision that the following day, Father Duvan and Miss Plunker would go around the convents of Dublin trying to secure one of them to house that retreat. And that we would meet again the next evening to find what had happened. And the following evening, we came together again. And uh, Father Devan and Miss Plunkett gave us an account of their day's work, which had been a very arduous one. They had gone through a number of the Dublin convents, finding failure in everyone because the uh, reaction of the nuns, the idea of housing these uh, 30 uh, lassies was quite a, uh, quite a reaction. Uh, no, they had no facilities for such a thing. It sounded awful at the time. And uh, they registered a total failure in all their Dublin city movements. And in this moment of uh, darkness, Miss Plunkett said, let's go out to Baldoyle and see Mother Angela Welch, who was the person who had written to me about the two, the, the, yeah. the two ladies. So they went off out there, it's about um, seven miles from the city. And they were received very cordially by that uh, wonderful person. And she uh, 
full of sympathy, full of anxiety to help. And they had uh, premises all right, and plenty of them. And she wanted to do it. So, in the end, uh, he said, I'll have to obtain the permission of our mother general. And she went to the telephone and she described what was at stake. <coughs> uh, the mother general listened patiently enough <coughs> and then uh, said firmly, no. <coughs> oh, boy. But that no was interrupted in the saying. That is, it never reached Mother Walsh. Uh, at that moment, our own uh, troubles were going on. And, I mean, national troubles, and that wire was cut. Oh, the phone wires were cut. The, the phone wire Is that so? was cut. And Mother uh, Walsh <coughs> worked uh, might and main to get communication. But communication room, there was none. And then she had these people waiting, and it, uh, she had to give an answer. And she uh, judged that she was in the position of being able to make her decision herself. And she said, yes. <laughs> nice. So they came back to us, and uh, that was a wonderful thing. At least, we, if we could uh, induce the girls to uh, consent, at least that was going to carry us along for a few days. And that uh, to gain even an hour of time at, in these circumstances was a triumph. So uh, now that it was a Wednesday evening. And on, uh, then we agreed that the following morning, a group of us, not all the missing, but a group of us would go down to Slickers and canvass the girls. Mm -hmm. It was 11 o'clock the following day. We went down. Uh, Father uh, Duvan, Father Creedon, uh, myself and Miss Plunk, I don't think Miss Scratton was there, which uh, is surprising. I, well, I, may, I may be wrong. But in any case, we went into the first room, which held four girls. And we proceeded to put the proposition before them. And, uh, oh, oh, what was the game? Oh, what was the game? Suspicion was the atmosphere. Some game. So we spent a long time, I'm sure, a full half hour, arguing with those four girls. And in my own way, I think I had a part in the favorable decision, which they eventually gave. They knew me. Oh. I was up and down Chancery Lane before their eyes for several years. Yes. They all knew me, and uh, uh, that's helped them to feel that uh, there was nothing terribly sinister. They didn't know any of the others, not even Father Creighton, who had only just come into their lives in the fair of the visitation of the previous few days. But in the end, we had extracted a favor, a consent from those four. And we went out and into room number two, which probably held a similar number. And the same anguish obtained there, same persuasion. And then we come out, and we find that uh, the whole population of number one room had ratted. Oh. <laughs> Some prophets of evil were busy among them, and this, oh, this is a plot on the part of the government. 
to lock you up. Yeah. Because you must remember, a new government has just come into possession, the Native Irish government. And uh, oh, this terrible! We have to go back to number one now and renew all the business. Then we come out with, with number two had rotted, <laughs> and then eventually we go on to room three and four and the rest. And we had got a consent from everybody by about five o'clock. Now that it was an ordeal. Oh, I can imagine. At that, I suppose it must have been. Well, half past four, when we finally succeeded, and you realize that in the interval we had absolutely nothing to eat, not even a cup of tea. So uh, the others dismissed, and Father Creedon and I went up to a, uh, what you'd call a stores in Camden Street, uh, uh, Gordon's. And we bought uh, we bought beds and a number of other things necessary to house people. <laughs> and Father Creighton was uh, buying like a like a hero. <laughs> <laughs> you think he had the bank of Ireland as his bank? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, sh I should have uh, mentioned that the nuns were in a panic about the uh, contact between the girls and their their holiday home that they were running up there as one of their activities. They said, as, as the, the nun said, if word went out through Dublin that they were entertaining street girls it would kill both their holiday home and their weekend retreat house. <laughs> <Which they thought. laughs> so they were, she uh, arranged that at no point would those different things touch each other. And we'd have to bring beds. Uh, they would give us bed linen, uh, which was uh, getting towards the end of its usefulness. And they would make us a present of that take away with us. They wouldn't even use it a second time after the girl. Isn't that something? Yeah. So, uh, having thus uh, let ourselves in for a debt, uh, I went into my office for the first time <laughs> that day. <laughs> and I endeavoured to do some uh, work. And uh, uh, I got a ring on the phone from Tom Fallon, who had heard about all these manoeuvres of ours. I suppose they'd gone through Dublin rapidly. <laughs> and he said that he understood that the Archbishop had been making some caustic comments uh -oh. about the whole <laughs> business, and I turned it uh, sentimentality. <laughs> So I um, uh, uh, couldn't see that, but in any case, this has been said. And the next thing, I got a ring on the phone from Father Devan. And Father, Devan, I mentioned this to Father Devan, and Father Devan was scared <laughs> that uh, oh, oh, call off the whole thing. He said call off the whole thing. We daren't go on if there's any uh, doubt in the minds of high authority. Oh, all is all off at once. So I didn't see the force of uh, letting all our anxiety and work up to date go down the drain like that. <clears throat> And I said we, we, that we'd have to decide on that formally. And uh, I arranged for a meeting in Father Tor's room uh, at 8 o'clock. And uh, Father Creighton, Father Tor, Father Robinson, Father Devan, myself. And we did not bring the two ladies <coughs> because I said 
they would be terribly dissatisfied. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the demands uh, for derived from the fact that a Jesuit had just been transferred to Australia from here for some little thing that the Archbishop disapproved of. Oh. And Father of Javan emphatically did not want to walk to Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, a nine wishing debate yeah. followed. Uh, not that we would give up. The only one who wanted really to give up was Father Devan. But the remainder was divided into two, uh, which one half thinking that we should go and put the whole thing to the Archbishop. Uh, and the other that uh, numbered myself they didn't see what this was was about. If the Archbishop doesn't move, let him say so. Why should we be going up pleading for a refusal? Yeah. What, 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 what's the harm? <laughs> <laughs> so, but then the caution, and especially with priests, you see there, that's the great problem. And finally, it was uh, agreed by the majority that fought the Cretan would go to the Archbishop, even at that late hour in the evening, yeah. and uh, put the thing before him and get his approbation. So we went up to his own room in the house, and after an unexpectedly short time, he went up to put on his best clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and after an unexpectedly short uh, time, he comes down and he, uh, he says, uh, I became sane, he said, when, when I went upstairs. <laughs> he said, why should we go to refuse in that way? <laughs> if he was, if he disapproves, he knows all about it now. Let him, let him uh, send this word that we'll obey him. He said, I have turned completely now against going. <laughs> and at that stage, that was the final decision. Yeah, that's now, that was uh, Thursday night. And we had made the arrangement with the girls that uh, a bus would be waiting for them at 11 o'clock at my house on Friday morning. And we'd go out to Baldor, and they would have a three-day retreat there. And uh, I engaged uh, a bus, not of the modern pattern, because uh, they didn't exist. What existed then were solid, tired vehicles, and uh, no top on them. There were open shallabangs, they were called at the time. And this had all the colours of the rainbow. It <laughs> only <laughs> And, uh, but uh, this would be at 11 o'clock. And uh, at this, oh yes, I should mention that uh, in the evenings debate among the priests and myself, uh, we had uh, agreed, all of us had agreed, that Father Devan regarded himself as being in a difficult position. And that we would release him from his undertaking to give the retreat, uh -huh. and at that he was most relieved. Yes. So the question arose then, <coughs> who'd give the retreat? So for the Creed and for the uh, uh said, well, we'll make a fist of it ourselves if we can't get any regular <laughs> retreats given. <laughs> So that was that. But then, uh, when looking around for a possible retreat giver, the name of Father Philip Murphy, OFM, was suggested. He was uh, more or less recently ordained Franciscan. He was stationed in that big church on the Keys, what they call Adam and Eve's. 
And uh, he had got a lot of fame in Dublin. Uh, he was giving a retreat in that church uh, at the time of the coming Grand National. And uh, he, uh, uh, he had tipped as the winner uh, Sergeant Murphy, which was a, an Irish contender in the race. And Sergeant Murphy robbed home at Big Odds. <laughs> <laughs> and this enriched the population of Dublin, who had all put their last dollar <laughs> on Sergeant Murphy. <laughs> and it spread for the Phillips fame throughout the city. And he came into our mouths for this reason. And I was then uh, told that in the early morning of the following day, that is the fateful Friday, I was to go down and put the proposition to him. The following morning, immediately after uh, Mass, I went in to see him sent for him, and this uh, St. Anthony-like figure came into me. Um, lovely person. And uh, I told him what had happened, and I asked him would he give the retreat. I would love to, he said. In fact, you can assume that I will. Of course, I have to get the provincial's permission. Oh, that was a, 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 a blow to the heart. Because, <laughs> 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 you know, so often obstacles come from the book. Oh, he said, you see my everything, you needn't, uh, uh, he, he'll, he'll give it with joy. So, we were all staged for the thing. I raced home then, had something to eat, and then I ambled down to Chancery Lane. And when, of course, when I was coming down, uh, you must not think that I was in any mood of uh, optimism, because as I was saying to myself, now the insiders of doubts have had nearly 24 hours with the girls, will one turn up. Mm, with that, you could not have any hope. But when I came down into a place called Golden Lane, off which Chancery uh, Lane is, the place was packed with people. So it was evident that something sensational was taking place. So I pushed my way through the crowd, and there were all our girls ready, standing around the street, each with a, a suitcase. So I pushed forward, and I said to them, look, don't be creating excitement, get, get moving now up to my house. And I got them moving, and a river of humanity flowed along with them. <laughs> and when we got up to Francis Street, there was a contrary river flowing in on that, that place. But, uh, and there, a few minutes later, arrives the gaudy Charabang. And we went into Myra House, and the three ladies, three ladies, another lady had agreed to go on the retreat with Miss Blunkett and Miss Grattan, and we were all assembled. Well, <clears throat> after uh, trying to recover from this unutterably happy shock, yes. <laughs> we uh, proceeded to shepherd the out into the uh, berths, and we were able to count. 23 out of the 30. Is that right? Then the three ladies, and I got into the front box along with two drivers. And then we started off right down to the quays. And the bus crawled along at a couple of miles an hour, this being caused by the cracked street. The whole thing had created an immense sensation. And we got down then onto the keys and turned to the right, and down the, um, 
this side of the key, the other side of the keys. And we came to the four courts. So we had to be building down there, which was half ruined by the bombardment of the previous week. Oh. And uh, it was a tremendous mob of soldiers there with uh, grappling irons pulling down some of the tottering walls. And I, the bus hall stopped there, and I got out and I ran down to Adam and Eve's. Because the optimist, well, we don't wait, you know whether we have a retreat cover. And the moment I left, a panic ensued in the bus, and there they think, ah, the, the, the soldiers are going to fire on us. <laughs> Excited minds. Yeah. I went in and asked for, for the Philip, and he came in a second, and he said, I have, oh, I've got the permission all right. And he came out and he looked up at the bus. And he said, I'd dearly love to go with you in that thing. But he said, there's no use challenging public opinion too much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, follow it by bus. Mm. Train, uh, as, as was at the time. But uh, I returned, and to my return, still the panic. And then we started off. It was a very beautiful day. And they sang good all the way out to Baldoyle. Exactly. We arrived at Baldoyle, and shortly after we arrived, Gordon's van with the beds arrived. Oh, is that so? Yeah. And I helped the, uh, <coughs> the van man to bring Harry in the beds. The ladies came and uh, decked them out with bedding. And there we were staged for the first retreat. So, uh, Father uh, Philip arrived just then, too. And he was going to give the first lecture before they would have their first meal. And he gathered them all around him, and he said, <coughs> have any of you, of you ever made an enclosed retreat? No. Not one of them ever had. So I, I, I tell you what you're supposed to do, and he gave them a, a little account. And then he said, uh, normally silence is a part of an enclosed street. I said, you're all in a disturbed state, and I'm not going to ask you to keep silence, so you can talk away as much as you like. And uh, he said, I, I understand that two of you do not belong to the Catholic Church. And uh, you might prefer to wander around outside during the lectures. So one girl spoke up, Lucy Jones, spoke up and she said, no, Father, she says, I have come along, come along with my pals and I'm going to go through everything with them. And the other girl, she said, that goes for me too, Father. Isn't that nice? And they attended everything. And before the retreat was finished, they had given in their names as candidates for the church. Isn't that nice? Well, those days were the most thrilling experience that, that could ever be imagined. I was in a most extraordinary position which could only have arisen as a direct intervention by heaven. I was my own master. When the new government had come into uh, being, it had resulted in my being given a position for the moment of independence. Oh, I was only dependent on a minister. Yes. I had no books to sign on coming in or going out. Very good. And uh, for days I wouldn't go to the office at all. <laughs> so <laughs> there was no problem over that. Isn't it remarkable? And uh, I attended all the lectures. And Father Philip proved to be a genuine angel from heaven. So the whole thing went through without any hitches at all. And uh, we had a little room put at our disposal as a headquarters uh, uh, room. And into this we went frequently to iron out the problems. The big problem being, 
Where are we going to go on Monday? Okay. Well, I think that is a perfect uh, question to end this little installment on, and we certainly invite our viewers to join us again when we again have the pleasure of recalling the early days of the Legion with Mr. Frank Duff. life she will keep. 